This is my favorite shot in all of cinema. Simple, clean, effective. While this shot has some obvious merits, explaining beyond those basic elements requires explaining what makes a perfect movie. Many people have presented theories on what makes a movie great, with Roger Ebert proposing the specific vision of the director is the most important quality, or many critics judging on the way a film achieves its purpose. There are countless theories, each with their own problems. But I feel cinematic perfection should be judged on three formal criteria. First, all individual aspects of the movie need to be working at the top of their game, defined by the combination of the elements serving a narrative purpose and aesthetic beauty. While there are movies that have great cinematography, acting, sound design, writing, editing, directing, etc., it is rare a movie has every individual aspect of that movie working at a true top tier, with the clearest example of this being Silence of the Lambs. This scene has near textbook acting, directing, cinematography, writing, editing, sound design basically everything. There is no choice that is not original, yet evocative, while simultaneously not overtaking the other choices. Second, all the cinematic elements need to be going in the same direction. When you learn how to make movies, the analytic purpose of each element is explained with great examples used in isolation, but it is rare all these elements combine towards a singular vision. This is best explained through example, and we will return to There Will Be Blood. I don't need the lease, thank no, you. We need you, we need Too you. Too much to confusion, thank you for your time. No, 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 there's no confusion. If I wouldn't just... take the lease if you gave it to me as a gift. In this scene, every individual aspect is combining toward the single idea that Daniel is in complete control. The sound forms itself around his voice, the camera stops and starts according to his movement, the actor portrays a complete sense of control, the film cuts around his movement. Every film element is formed around the single idea of establishing Daniel as a man who understands what he is doing in an absolute sense. Finally, the movie needs to have an understanding of the conventions and navigate around those conventions to its own advantage. People have watched a bunch of films, so ignoring other movies would be foolish. Instead of ignoring conventions, filmmakers need to understand the conventions and purposely make a choice to follow, break, or synthesize those conventions to create meaning. A clear example of this can be seen in the way Get Out navigates the horror genre to create additional meaning about coded American racism, or Starship Troopers' understanding of the war genre and propaganda techniques to display the inherently fascistic nature of war movies, or the editing choices in Serpico, or Lady Bird following the conventions of a teen comedy until the last moments to its advantage, or the choice to make Doctor Strange love a comedy, or every choice in Phantom Thread.
please don't move so much, Alma. Phantom Thread is a movie that understands every small choice it's making. Like all of Paul Thomas Anderson's movies, it's deeply intentional. This is an idea for Cyril's office that, as you can tell, seems uh, mm, wrong. I feel quite bad about the fact that somebody, a very good artist, painted those walls. We wallpapered over it, so maybe one day uh, in the future somebody will take that wallpaper down and find those beautiful paintings underneath there. The film purposefully breaks hallmark cinematic rules such as the 180 degree rule and the 30 degree rule. The plot is purposefully formulaic when it needs to be, but breaks away from audience expectations in interesting and exciting ways. While not a perfect movie, this movie is the best example of understanding the cinematic form and abusing that understanding. By combining these three aspects, a movie can achieve perfection. Now, I know what you're thinking. What a modernist twerp trying to quantify movies. But there's a difference between a perfect and favorite movie. And this really gets into the bigger problem between objectivism and subjectivism in art criticism. To illustrate, here are my lists of my top films, objectively and subjectively. As you can see, there's some similarities between these lists, with being John Malkovich, The Big Lebowski, and There Will Be Blood showing up on both lists. Equally, The Synecdoche, New York is number one on my subjective list, but does not appear on my objective list whatsoever. People rarely separate these lists because we have lived in a world of pure subjective postmodern film analysis for a majority of film history. While subjectivism has given us many directors in films, it is not an approach without flaw. For example, I don't think Lolita would be as well known as it is if it came out in a subjective world. Even though it's a technical masterpiece of literature, it's not an enjoyable book in any way. Subjective critique can make people ignore masterpieces. For example, Holy Motors is often overlooked as one of the classic films of the last decade, largely because it is not in any way easy or entertaining to watch. Additionally, when awards bodies give out awards more based on subjective interpretation and not the objective quality of the films, this can be seen in the 2005 Oscars going to Crash over Brokeback Mountain, and the 2018 Oscar going to Green Book over Black Klansman, or Sorry to Bother You. The Oscars are highly predictable predictable in the movies they award because they have a few themes and styles they are attached to, which in turn means more films of those styles will be rewarded, creating a cycle of similar subjective analysis. These awards are significant because they determine what gets funding and what gets made. Now, I'm not saying objective critique needs to be held as the new standard with subjective critique being thrown away. No critical extreme can exist on its own. Rather, I'm advocating for a synthesis between subjective and objective critique to determine movie quality. A new metamodern review style. Metamodernism can be described as the midpoint between the scientific descriptivism of modernist objectivism and the cynical deconstruction of postmodern subjectivism. The key idea behind metamodernism is that truth can be achieved by holding two contradictory ideas as equally true at the same time, a distinct both and logic. Applied onto criticism, this means incorporating both the objective quality of the film and your subjective enjoyment of it into your assessment. For example, I think Death Becomes Her is one of the most fun and enjoyable movies ever made, and also recognize that it is not a good movie. Furthermore, metamodern critique means going away from the binary critical approach provided by both modernists and postmodernists, in which there is only variations on good and bad, instead allowing a movie to be simply interesting or unique, allowing these to be the description of a piece instead of working as modifiers on the binary. Through this approach towards film analysis, we can display a far wider amount of art incorporating filmmakers who are left out in both of the previous extremes. As a reminder, this is what my separated lists look like, and here's what my list from a metamodern perspective looks like. And now to return back where we started. This shot happens to be perfect encapsulating the ideals of cinematography, sound design, acting, and directing. Those elements are unidirectional, and those elements understand the cinematic conventions in the traditional pacing of an action scene. But it's more than that. A certain unexplainable part of me loves this scene, for reasons beyond traditional one word after another human language can describe. 